the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, the earth is a witness. We are living in a time when the evolutionary paradigm seems to be the only paradigm acceptable to the world when it comes to the question of origins. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now, these theistic evolutionists, they claim that there can be a marriage between the two concepts. But theologically, if you are a Christian, they are mutually exclusive. The one claims that we come from an ignoble origin and are evolving to a superior being. The other, however, claims that we had a noble origin that there was a fall, and that this fall necessitated a savior, an intervention, that eternal life was lost, and only upon this redemption could be regained. So the two are mutually exclusive, and a savior becomes unnecessary if the evolutionary paradigm should be correct. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. One of the nebulas is called the eye of God. So scientists look at this magnificent universe and they come to the conclusion that there are certain things which are so profound that the human being cannot grasp them and cannot contemplate their magnificence. The Bible says, you alone are the Lord, you have made the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The hosts of heaven worship you, Nehemiah 9 verse 6. The Bible says this universe has its origin in the word of God. Now if we look at the great galaxies of the world, we see that they spiral around each other and that they internally spiral around some central core. And this brought many questions. When you look at the universe, it seems to be expanding, and this gave rise to the Big Bang Theory. But the Bible says in Revelation 14, 7, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So we have this conflict. The one is reduced to an allegory, and the other one, well, could it be that there is a creator God? Well, science claims that we do have an origin, but it is an origin which came from an explosion, which is termed the Big Bang Theory. And where are we heading in this Big Bang Theory? To nothing, because it will all cascade in upon itself again. And then the whole process will start over. It's like a Brahma breathing out and a Brahma breathing in. And all is not well in the Big Bang Theory, as the scientific journals such as Nature from time to time uh, bring to the forefront. The Big Bang not yet dead, but in decline. And constantly you need sub-theories to uphold this central theory. According to the Big Bang Theory, the universe was created between 10 and 20 billion years ago from the random cosmic explosion. I find it interesting that the astrophysicists and uh, scientists involved with the study of the universe, such as Alan Gutt and Steinhardt, wrote in Scientific American that the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. 
isn't that fascinating? Nothing exploded and created everything. The Bible says God spoke and it stood fast. There was nothing and it came into being. So there's really no difference in terms of the origin when it comes to the Bible and science. It's not more believable that nothing exploded and gave rise to everything than it is to believe that God spoke. Where did God come from, people will say. Where did the Big Bang come from, one could answer. Spiral galaxies tell the story of an explosion. Well, then why are they spiraling? Well, they're spiraling because that kernel in the beginning, that cosmic egg, must have been spiraling. Because only in this way can we explain spiraling galaxies and angular momentums of planets revolving around stars. You see, if there was a cosmic explosion, then everything would be spreading out linearly in a unidirectional fashion. If it is spiraling, it means that the cosmic egg must have been spiraling, but then everything must be spiraling in the same direction, but it doesn't. Some spiral clockwise and some spiral anticlockwise. There is no scientific solution for these problems. But then you will tell me, wait a minute, we have lots of evidence. Radiometric data tells us that we are very, very old and this is in line with the evolutionary paradigm. Well, if you think about radiometric dating, there is no clock in a rock. It's all a question of isotopes relative to each other. So if you take uranium lead dating, there's a parent isotope, uranium, and there's a daughter isotope, which is an isotope of lead. And the one has to decay into the other, and the rate of decay determines how old something is. But here are the basic assumptions. You must assume that the rate of decay and the half-lives have remained constant over time. And you must assume that the clock was set to zero when the material was formed. And you must assume that we are dealing with a closed system and none of these three can be ascertained with any certainty. The rate of decay can change if there are solar flares. We can see that today. The clock, was it set to zero? You can analyze rock as it comes out of a volcano and you can find out that it can measure hundreds of millions of years in age. So there was no zero reset, which means only parent and no daughter isotope. Plus, you cannot guarantee that it's a closed system because elements can leach into a rock and leach out of a rock. And differentially, because some are more soluble than others. So you have no basis for a clock whatsoever. So time is purely relative. Relative to what? Relative to the paradigm of the person involved in the discussion. So nobody can say the earth is young or old and be a winner on the basis of radiometric dating. The Bible says... In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. The great explosion, as it were, of water from the subterranean deep, a great rift around the earth, waters from above falling down and the whole world covered in water simultaneously destroying all terrestrial life. Now science cannot afford such a paradigm. If you take the geological column, which is a record, so we assume of the age of the earth and all the fossils that in the mar, this record shows a continuity, so it is claimed, of organisms from simple to complex. Now, if this continuity had to be interrupted at some stage by a universal flood which wiped out all terrestrial life, then the whole evolutionary process would have to begin again. And therefore, this cannot be tolerated by evolutionary thinking. 
Now, if you look at this geological column, you have the various layers, one layered upon the other, but the contacts between the layers show no erosional features. They are absolutely flat. The oldest supposedly at the bottom, the youngest at the top. Here are three layers and we can see these delineations between the layers where the layers are absolutely flat. But the top one subject to erosion. Now if this one was once the surface of the earth, surely it should be subject to erosion and should show the same deep channeling or mountain or valley uplift. Nothing. Straight. We have magnificent erosional features, but it doesn't answer the question, was this rapid or was it slow? In this case, this is obviously slow, but these great erosional features could just as well have been by a mega flood phenomenon. Or why are the rocks curved and bent? Well, if they are rocks, they would shatter. How can they bend unless they are pliable? And a pliable Rock series bending at the same time. That would rather point to catastrophic event than to long periods. Well, the scientists will say maybe the rocks were heated so that they became pliable when they were lifted up to be bent in mountain forming. But these are sedimentary rocks and they show no record of heat whatsoever. What about catastrophic washouts? The great canyons of the world are supposed to have eroded over millions of years of time. But they are all V-shaped. And V-shaped can only happen rapidly and not slowly. So they are evidence of catastrophic washouts. Another point which we need to ponder, that is if we climb up this geological column through its various ages, we come here to a period which is called the Cretaceous, which occurs quite high up in the geological column, just before the Cenozoicum, where we have the birds and the mammals. Now what does the Cretaceous consist of? It consists of the calcium carbonate skeletons of marine micro and macro fossils. And these can only accumulate in water. Now this layer is universal and stretches from continent to continent, which means that the whole world was underwater at the same time. And if that is the case, then the entire evolutionary paradigm falls flat because the evolutionary continuity would have been disrupted. Here is a brown coal deposit which we find in Central Europe, not along the coast somewhere. And this is a relatively young forest deposit. And people would believe that these were great forests which decayed and became compacted. And it could only have happened on land. But when you investigate them, you find marine fossils like molluscans in them. And you find chalk deposits consisting of the skeletons of radiolarians. These were deposited in marine sediments. Forests, huge deposits of brown coal in relatively recent time, therefore not subject to depression and seawater ingression into the land. There's a study which was done by Arthur Chadwick on paleocurrents and what they tell us about the history of the Earth. Now, paleocurrents are fascinating. If you look at the ripples on a riverbed, by studying the shape of the ripple, you can determine in which direction the water flowed. Now, you can take the rocks of the geological time periods and you can study those as well. And then you will find that in the various continents, for example here in South America in one age period, the water will have moved from the one side right across the continent to the other side. That's what the rocks show us. And in the next age, in the exact opposite direction. That means there could have been no mountains, no valleys, no riverbeds, no canyons, no features which we in any way associate with a normal world in those times. These are catastrophic evidences of 
unidirectional water flow right across the continent. This speaks of universal catastrophe. And then we have the fossil graveyards, like in the British Museum, the fossilized remains of an antelope, a gazelle, a horse, and a carnivore are presented in the slab. The fossils are surrounded by floodplain deposits, suggesting that the animals were swept together by torrential floods. There's no weathering and the damage to the fossils, so they must have been buried quickly. Well, how do you explain a whole Karoo Basin, which is ordered in a similar fashion, with animals washed into position, if they were just flood plains. Or what about the orientation of fossils, which show that there was a unidirectional stream flow? These are evidences of a tremendous water catastrophe. Or what about fossils where you have fish swallowing fish and being instantly fossilized? These are catastrophes that explain these things. When life exploded, isn't it interesting? that in the paleontological record, we find that the various phyla, these are the hugest, largest categories of animals on the planet. Phylum cordata, phylum arthropoda, phylum mollusca, all the snails and marine molluscans and the octopus and all of them in one huge category, that all of these phylas appeared simultaneously. Surely, evolution would demand that over long periods of time we would evolve one phyla after the other, but all of them appear simultaneously. If you look at the paleontological record, you will find that the turtles have been turtles, have been turtles throughout their paleontological record. The same with the lizards, the snakes, uh, Svenadon from New Zealand, the crocodiles, all of these creatures, the birds, the mammals, they've been the same. There is no evidence of an evolutionary change over time. When we look at our genes and we look at the expression of the genes, we call our information in our genes the genotype. And the expression of those genes, that's the phenotype. That's us, the real us. Now, isn't it fascinating that natural selection, which is the driving force of the evolutionary process, can only operate at the level of the phenotype? Something must be there in order to choose whether one is better or the other. Natural selection does not answer the question, where does something come from? It only chooses between two options or more options that are already there. And this phenotype is determined by the genotype. Now, where does that come from according to the evolutionary paradigm? Well, it's just information. You cannot test it at this level, so it had to come about by chance. So our intricate genetic system, with its intricate proofreading and all those mechanisms involved, came about by chance. Unbelievable. That's like believing that the engineer's book Describing how to build this particular aeroplane came about by chance. Because only when the aeroplane is there in its phenotype can we actually test whether it operates successfully or not. But the manual came about by chance. And not only that, not only the manual came about by chance, because a manual in itself will not create anything. You need the apparatus and you need the manpower and you need the expertise to translate what is in the book to the phenotype. According to the scientific theory of evolution, that all came about by chance. You need a lot of faith to believe that. Moreover, if you look at all the creatures on the planet, all these different types of creatures, every single one has intricate, basic, molecular mechanism which constitute life. And since they all have the same mechanisms, the same Krebs cycles, the same glycolysis, all of them, they either evolved separately, independently, or the more logical one, as depicted here, is that they come from an ancestral creature, which means that they were there all at the same time. Life exploded 
It stood fast. Evolution can't explain that. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day, Genesis 1.31. Looking at the planet today, we can certainly see good, but everything is not good. We see animals hurting each other. We see cats playing with a mouse. We see carnivores tearing other animals to pieces. Darwin looked at this world and he said, evolution explains it. Survival of the fittest. The Bible said it was good. It was very good. There was no death. All animals were vegetarian. All the animals of the earth ate the plants of the field. That's ridiculous. Why have animals got stings? That's evolution. Why do animals have structures to suck blood? That's evolution. Is that a good creation? This animal here has a proboscis, which is Designed, if you were, to suck blood. And they can use this apparatus. It has all the enzymes to prevent blood coagulating and it can suck blood out of our system. That's evolution. But why does the male then not use it to suck blood? He has the same enzymes. Is he using it to suck only plant juices? Yes, and those same enzymes prohibit the coagulation of the plant juices. So I can look at it with a different pair of glasses and say, originally there probably were all plant juices, but something changed and they became parasites. If I look at the parasites of the world, many parasites are without gut because they develop in other organisms, but their larval stages show all the organs. Therefore the genes for those organs must still be present. They'll just switch off deactivated. If we look at spiders and we look at snakes, we say surely these are organs of destruction and are more in line with evolution. Well, the answer is that uh, these organs and these poisonous glands are only transformed salivary glands. There's nothing new. There's no evolution when it comes to parasitology. There's only a devolution, a deterioration a deactivation of genes. If we look at things like legless lizards, the genes for the legs are still there. They're just highly reduced or totally absent, but sometimes they appear in the embryology. So the genes must still be there. They're just deactivated. Maybe a change took place. Thorns and thistles it will produce for you. What are the thorns? Spines modified leaves. The same genes which make a leaf unfurl make it fold in upon itself and dry out to a thorn. Sometimes wind alone can make a branch change into a thorn. That's not evolution. That's adaptability of an existing genetic system. But what about lions? Surely these creatures are designed to be carnivores through the evolutionary process. They have become killers. On the basis of their teeth, we can say that they are definitely designed for meat-eating. But what about bears? 86% of their diets is plant food, and yet they're classified as carnivores. And when it comes to the panda bear, that's classified as a carnivore on the strength of its teeth, and yet it is an exclusive plant eater. It eats bamboo. So the structure of the tooth does not necessarily say that something evolved to be a killer, maybe if we take these glasses, God has left enough evidence that originally all of them were plant eaters. Yeah, but what about the fact that some of them have short guts and some of them have long guts? In my own experiments at the university, I've discovered that if you feed an animal animal protein, the gut becomes shorter. If you feed it plant protein, the gut becomes longer. That's not evolution, that's adaptability within one generation. The fossil record shows us that everything was bigger in the past than it is now. Today, we have minuscule animals compared with the past. Well, science would have it that everything should evolve from small to large, and not from large to small. You cannot start with an elephant and end with an amoeba. You have to start with an amoeba and end with an elephant. So how do we explain this? Why is everything large in the past and small today? If science 
were correct, then we should have low diversity in the past and great diversity today as animals evolved from a chance appearance sometime in the past. But the paleontological record shows the reverse. Great diversity in the past, less diversity today. If we look at these fossils, then we see that the giant crocodiles of the past can incorporate the living, fully grown crocodiles in a small portion of their mouth. So, is this a different creature? Anatomically, it's identical. It's just reduced in size. Reptiles keep on growing, so maybe they were just healthy and old. Just like a tortoise in the Galapagos Islands will start just as small as any other tortoise, but it can be this big because it's old. It's got nothing to do with evolution. It's got to do with resilience. Or Tyrannosaurus rex with these teeth, a large animal like this would be a useless carnivore. Its momentum doesn't allow it to be a carnivore, scavenger maybe. But even there, there's a limit to the size that these creatures could have been. There's no real evidence that tooth structure determines exactly what an animal ate. Or creatures like Triceratops, did they have these horns to protect themselves against their vicious enemies? Then why do these little creatures like this chameleon have horns to protect themselves? No, they're secondary sex characteristics. It is a question of how we see things. What about birds? Did they evolve from reptiles, as we are told? Did they look like this, our ancestral birds? Or what about the lungs and the feather anatomy of birds? Nobody can explain how an intricate structure like a feather could have evolved from a scale. And in any case, the one is of mesodermal origin and the other one is of ectodermal origin. They don't even have the same origin in terms of their anatomy. Or what about the lung? The bellow-type lung evolving to a through-flow lung with no evidence of any such thing ever happened. It's no wonder that Storz Olsen, the curator of birds of the Nat National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian Institute, wrote that the feathered dinosaur pictures are simply imaginary and have no place outside of science fiction. The idea of feathered dinosaurs and the pteropod origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic, who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. It's almost like a religion. Truth and careful scientific weighing of the evidence have been among the first casualties in their program, which is now fast becoming one of the grander scientific hoaxes of our age, the paleontological equivalent of cold fusion. Isn't that fascinating? That even the evolutionary scientists tell us that what we are impressed to believe is not based on good science. What about the origin of primates? All the primates we have today are contemporaneous, and everything that happens in the paleontological record is based on conjecture. The Bible says, For I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. We have a noble origin, but not according to the evolutionary paradigm. Is loosely closer related to man than other astrolopithecines? This question remains unanswered, amongst other things, because each kind of Australopithecus has its own features that might be a link to humankind. Well, here's a problem. This is in the British Museum. There's no evidence, but it doesn't appear like that in the textbooks. Lucy is displayed as the supermodel of evolution. But they use the arm-to-leg ratio, which you cannot determine because there are so many pieces missing. The head is totally ape. The hip, they say, is distorted. But if it is like that, it remains a normal ape. Some scientists say this is merely a pignichum, and uh, the rest is wishful thinking. And when it comes to the newer skeletons that have been found, like Ardi, they look at the structure, and on the basis of somewhat longer fingers than in the others, then you have all of these fabulous conjectures. 
Isn't it natural to have natural variation in finger length today or hip size or any one of those features? This could just be natural variation which is common to any kind of species. Understanding Ardi, hominid discoveries rewrite book on human ancestry. Well, look at the pieces that they found, only these tiny little pieces. And on this basis, a whole new evolutionary paradigm is built up. It's always an Australopithecine. It's either a hominid or it's an Australopithecine. There is no fossil link between them. It's pure wishful thinking. The Bible says in Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We have a choice. We can look at the world from an evolutionary paradigm, or we can look at the world from a creation perspective. There is nothing which forces us to accept the one paradigm as being better than the other one. Both of them require faith, and none of them can exclusively prove that they are right. And therefore the choice remains with us. If we believe the Bible, and we look at the prophetic value of the Bible, and we see all of these other paradigms, and we see lives changed, Maybe the book is believable and we can believe the God of the Bible. On the other hand, if you want to be an evolutionist, there's nothing to prevent you from being one. The choice is ours.